The Bible says in Matthew 24, verses 29 to 31, yep. that Jesus in the second coming would come and destroy the wicked. So, and I'll quote from those verses. Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Mm. What's your response to this verse? Mm -hmm. Why haven't you returned in the clouds as the Bible verse states? Yeah. Um, and if you were or are Jesus, why haven't you already made things right here on earth? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, these are very common questions that we're asked by Christians. And, and you know, obviously the verses in Matthew 24, Luke, Luke 21 and Mark 13 are regularly quoted to us mm -hmm. about the reason why I cannot be Jesus. Yep. And we have covered in many other questions already, the re, you know, what's actually happened with these particular verses. But let's, uh, let's look at this scripture. First, it doesn't really say anything about making things right on earth. If you read it, if you read it properly, it actually says that the people on earth would mourn. Mm. So that doesn't sound like things are going to be right for them. So uh, there's this presumption uh, in many religious groups of people that if Jesus came to the earth, he'd make things right for them. But the reality is all that many of the predictions about Jesus coming, which I'm not saying are true, but, but the Bible, which the Bible portrays as me coming and hurting people. And in mm. fact, murdering people, killing mm. people is what the Bible is stating. And, and many of the people who, who, who want this to happen are Christians. And the reason why they want it to happen is because they want people who are not practicing what they believe is true to be killed so that they can get on with practicing what they believe is true. And uh, that's not how God works and it's certainly not how I work and never have worked. If you look at my attitude towards unbelievers in the first century, it was a lot more tolerant than that. And I certainly would never perpetrate any violence towards a person who, who decides to not believe me. And, uh, and a person has the complete free will choice to not believe anything I say. I'm perfectly tolerant of that. So this, that's the first thing I probably would like to say about this particular verse in that, uh, you know, when people quote it to me, they forget my nature and character. And they also forget that, uh, that God has no desire to harm the wicked. God mm -hmm. has a desire to correct the wicked. Mm -hmm. God has a desire to see the wicked turn into good people. Mm -hmm. The reason why I spent most of my time not with the self-righteous in the first century, which I feel many Christians have become, it, but rather with the people who saw themselves as sinners is because they were more open to receiving the truth. Mm. They were more open to receiving the truth about themselves and they were more open to receiving a relationship with God than the people who were self-righteously determining that they were better than everyone else. Mm -hmm. The Pharisees were people who determined that they were better than everyone else and as a result of that, they were not very open to truth and they were certainly not very humble. They, they had the complete inability for self-examination. Yep. Sure. Now, I don't have a Christian's perspective about God. I don't have a Christian's perspective about love. I don't have a Christian's perspective about truth. Because all of the Christian's perspective about God, love and truth uh, have all been based around the Bible. And, and as I've mentioned in other questions, they are flawed. Mm -hmm. uh, flawed perspectives. So I don't have that perspective of uh, assuming power, of assuming becoming a judge, of, of, of destroying the wicked, of, of you know, fixing up the earth, because I already know that God is my ruler. God is my ruler. Yeah. God is my king. And I only wish to do that which God's love would instruct me to do. Uh -huh. And it certainly would never instruct me to destroy the wicked. Well, what about in this verse, it says, not as you said, it doesn't say really that you're going to destroy the wicked. No. It just says you're going to gather up and elect people, yep. which does you might leave the wicked alone and just gather all these people up off to somewhere in the clouds with you. Um, well, it says that I'll gather them to the clouds, but the reality is the whole reason why I'm here is to help gather more people who wish to become more loving and truthful. Uh -huh. And that is certainly a truth. And yep. if you look at it metaphorically, mm -hmm. um, you could certainly say that this verse is true. 
that right. when I come, I will come with my friends, which my angels are, which the angels are in the heavens. The angels are just people on who used to live on earth, who are now at one with God, who are my mates in the yeah, spirit world. Yeah. And I am, have definitely come with them. There's plenty of them on the planet at the moment helping me out. And and I've come to you know sh share the truth with others and to gather the people who are willing to listen to it. And that is exactly true. That's exactly what I've done. So the irony is if you looked at it more metaphorically, um, there is a lot of potential truth uh -huh. in this verse, yep. but that's not how Christians see it. See, Christians see it not metaphorically, yep. but they see it as literal. Yep. They see it as me coming on the cloud. Now, if I sat on a cloud, I would only be seen by people around about you know 50 miles from the cloud or, or about 70 kilometres at the most from the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be seen by everyone on Earth. In fact, given that the Earth is a circle, yeah. It's a physical impossibility for somebody to be seen in every location on the earth at the same time. Yeah. It's a physical impossibility, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so even to believe in the verse as a literal statement is illogical mm -hmm. and it's also a physical impossibility. So what about a Christian who doesn't believe in it in a very, very literal sense, mm -hmm. but has the sense that on your return, it will be known globally and there will be a sense of great power and glory returning to the earth in, in the sense of love being very powerful and glorious. Yeah. So what would you say to that Christian? Well, I'd say to that Christian that they're interpret interpreting things very well, like from the Bob. That's exactly what I hope to achieve. It's not going to be achieved instantly, as the verse as it tends to suggest, because to change people's hearts takes time. Yeah. It's not something that can happen overnight. I'm not going to come and just manipulate people's hearts somehow uh -huh. to, to acceptance. I'm going to present truth because it's the truth that sets people free. And there will be lots of people eventually who wish to listen to this truth. I've only just begun. I've barely begun, in yeah. fact, because, because I'm not yet at one with God. And it takes firstly me becoming at one with God for me to begin the rest of the work. Uh -huh. So the reality is that I've barely begun the work of my return. And, uh, and, you know, I began that work around eight or nine years ago and, and I'm continuing the work now. And eventually, once I become it, when we've got, I'll actually begin the actual work of, of distributing the truth in the manner that I wish to. And there may be many people who listen as a result. And in fact, the entire world will know eventually. That's my hope. And so, and this is my uh, question, I suppose. Um, when you feel that uh, when you achieve the state of it one with God, yep. obviously that does mean that you will be reflecting a lot of love. Exactly. It? exactly. And it wouldn't be a case of manipulating people's hearts. Would you say that that would just affect people's hearts and of it course. would be known globally? Of course. Like people will find already in my company, even though I'm not at one with God, just my stating of the truth causes them to cry and to have emotional experiences that they've never had before just being in my presence now. So once I become at one with God, what will, what will happen? Yeah. Things will certainly happen. The people who are resistive to truth feel very angry in my company instantly. Mm -hmm. A lot of times they don't even know why. Yep. <laughs> you know, they're yep. just instantly angry, just like people were in the first century. And I'm not yet even at one with God. And, yeah. for that, and what do you think is going to happen when I am? <laughs> yeah. So these kind of things will certainly happen. So my question really is then about this verse that... Mm -hmm. Could we say then that the second coming is really not you, you the second coming they're anticipating, say, in this verse of mm -hmm. great power and glory through and, and a knowledge of the a presence of this love that is powerful and glory, yeah. and glorious, yeah. um, that that will occur once you achieve it one moment with God again or here on earth. Mm. That will be the second coming that they are uh, some of them are waiting for. Yes, but I'm not going to come on a cloud. No. And I'm not going to gather your elect to a cloud. Yes. You know, I, and it's a physical impossibility for me to be seen by everyone on earth at the same time, unless I, I, I turn into some kind of spiritual being with multiple bodies, uh, which I don't expect will occur, although it is possible because yeah. I am capable of producing yeah. multiple spirit bodies at the same time. But, But, you know, these are all things that, you know, can be done, but I don't really have a strong desire to do, so I don't see myself doing them. And I suppose also what you're saying very clearly is this this idea of gathering an elect 
implies some sort of judgment and that you wouldn't that is not your nature nor God's not at all it's all, all I wish to do is gather the people who want to have a relationship with God and help them have a relationship with God mm -hmm. and uh, and the people who don't want to have a relationship with God I'm perfectly fine with that you're allowed to not have a relationship with God that's how God feels sure and that's how I feel sure God created a system in which you are allowed to not have a relationship with God God's not going to punish you for not having a relationship with God. God doesn't give you freedom only to take it away, only to punish you for the wrong choice. God gives you freedom to choose. But, but when I say freedom, God gives you freedom based around love. So as long as you choose love, you have complete freedom. If you, if you choose love and decide that you're not going to love God, you've still got a lot of freedom. Mm -hmm. Right? From God's perspective, you can, you're completely free to do that. You're just never going to become at one with God and so never going to have the benefits of such a relationship. That's yeah. all. And when I say that's all, that's quite a lot for me. <laughs> yeah. Like yeah. It's something that I would definitely not want to do. But, yeah. but, but, it, but for a person who doesn't believe it's very important, well, they're probably not going to believe it's that important as I do. The key for them to bear in mind is that God gives this freedom and God doesn't take it away arbitrarily. God has given the freedom for people to make a choice, but God has not given us a choice about love. Mm -hmm. And when I say God has not given us a choice about love, what God has done is allowed us the free will to choose to be unloving, but God has created a universe that corrects unloving behavior. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, we get corrected if we choose to be unloving. And I know that and I've known that for 2,000 years and that's why I'd never do some of the things the Bible suggests that I would do. Sure, sure. Um, I said, I feel it's important probably to also address some of the issues. Like in this particular verse, it raises a lot of issues or contradictions mm -hmm. in my opinion of my nature. So for example, um, it's basically saying that I'm coming to judge people and I'm going to pull out the people who I believe are good mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm going to either, you know, there's other verses that suggest I'll get rid of or burn with fire the people who I believe are bad. Yeah. Right? In fact, there's a verse in Matthew 24 that suggests such a thing. But, but, but then again, if you look at, say, Matthew 18 and you look at verses like this where in, in 21 and 22 I said, then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And some verses say 77, 77. times seven. Yeah. Right? And what was I... So, so my attitude towards people who sin against me is to forgive them. How could I ever contemplate killing them if my attitude is to forgive them? Yeah. I could never contemplate killing them if my attitude is to forgive them. So any person who believes that I'm going to return and kill the wicked has a flawed concept of my own nature and the nature of God. Mm. Um, if we look at perhaps uh, Revelation 19 verse 15, here's, here's the second contradiction in the opposite direction. It says, um, where is it? It says, the armies of heavens were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine li linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Wow. Very dark verse. This verse was, was penned by, by a man who was not the Apostle John. Um, it was a modification to the book of Revelation, penned by a man who was violent in his nature, who had some very violent spirits with him. And he basically was saying that God has rage in him and that I would come and express God's rage to humanity. Mm -hmm. What a load of crap, to be frank. Like, why would I ever, ever contemplate expressing God's rage when God doesn't have rage, for mm -hmm. a start? God is never wrathful with humanity. God is never unkind to anyone. God is always forgiving. God knows God's laws will eventually correct every wrong. So God doesn't have a need to punish people or destroy people. So this verse is completely false and, and written by people, people who you know, were also under heavy influence of very dark spirits. Uh, but incorporated into the Bible because it was a copyist of the Bible mm -hmm. at the time. 
And if we look at another, so, so there's, there's one, there's a, there's a, you know. So in one verse it's saying that you, you're you preaching forgiveness and in the other that you will actually that, that God's have got a wrath murderous and, fury. and that you would be an instrument of that. Yeah. 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 How, 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 how much opposed can you yeah. be to, to yeah. each other? And uh, there's another one, I think it was in Matthew 5. Uh, here's another verse. This is contrary again. It says, you have heard that it was said, love your neighbour and hate your enemy. But I tell you, this is me speaking now according to this scripture, love your enemies and pray for those per who persecute you that you may be sons of your father in the heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rains upon the righteous and the unrighteous. If you love those who love you, what reward will you get? Are not even the tax collectors doing that? And if you greet only your brothers, what... What are you doing more than others? Do not even pagans do that. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, what was I suggesting there? God is never going to take actions of violence towards people mm -hmm. that he's created. Mm -hmm. He's never going to do it. He, he only takes corrective action towards people. And he's saying here, and I'm saying here, that you must love your enemies so much that you're willing to put up with the negative things your enemies do towards you. Yeah. And and if if I'm recommending that to people and yet I don't practice that myself, I'm a hypocrite. Yeah. And if I'm recommending that God says to do that and God doesn't actually do it, then God's a hypocrite. Yeah. So the reality is if God destroys the wicked, God's a hypocrite. Mm. Because God's asking me to not or other people to not do it, but God will do it herself or himself. Now, I suggest to you, God is never a hypocrite. God will never destroy the wicked. God created them. God is going to correct the wicked. Yeah. They're going to be corrected. It may take a long time, but they'll be corrected. Yeah. And that's a guarantee because all of God's laws of the universe are designed to correct. And so it's not behavior. going to happen when you say it could take some time. It's not going to happen on a day of judgment. There's not going to be no. fiery um, damnation no. all in a moment. No. There, are, there are laws in place, yes. is basically what you're saying. And exactly. they're always at work and they'll continue to work. They will continue to work forever. God never changes the laws that God places in place. They've always existed. They always will continue to exist. God is perfect. God knows what laws to make. Yeah. <laughs> God knows how, you know, God, God knows, you know, the capacity of man. God created the capacity of man, mm -hmm. so he knows it. He knows the capacity of man is to be very evil because God created the potential of man making choices that make them evil. Mm -hmm. But God didn't tell them to go evil. God wants them to choose good. So then for, for Christian people watching who perhaps have a feeling that, um, and I hope I'm doing their questions justice, mm -hmm. but if they have a feeling that the purpose of your second coming is to bring this judgment mm -hmm. and you're now saying definitively that is not the case no. what is the purpose then of your second coming uh, there are multiple purposes of the second coming the, the, one of them is to illustrate further truths that i illustrated in the first century to the planet these include truths about the soul union state the the unified soul mate state that was not uh, available in the first century we also have come to illustrate divine femininity on the planet. So there's another, you know, that's not really been seen on the planet up to this point. And we want to illustrate that by becoming at one with God and being, and for yourself being the feminine yeah. expression of God. Well, and that, that really includes me, that, that statement, doesn't it? To exactly. Be the feminine expression, yeah. Exactly. The third thing is we want to demonstrate what a soul union is, what it, what it means for the two halves of the soul to be one person, what it means to be the one soul. We, we want to illustrate many truths about the universe and how the universe works. We also would have done it for our own discovery, for our own, because this is something nobody's done yet. This is the first time it's been done, so we wanted to try it and see how it turns out. You know, sometimes we regret that decision <laughs> and sometimes we feel it was a great decision. And I feel in the future we'll always feel it's a great decision. Um, there are also other things that we would like to do. We understand that God is not always going to have the uh, desire to give her love to people who continue to refuse it. Mm -hmm. We understand that God's going to withdraw that desire to give love to people who continue to refuse it for a period of time. And it would be a shame for people to miss out on this first harvest, if you like, this, this 
this first time on this planet that God has offered love. For the last 2,000 years it's been offered. And it'd be a shame for people to miss out on it. Mm -hmm. so, so what we would like to do is, and we're not saying in the future that God would not offer it again. In fact, we fully expect that God would offer it again. But, but there'll be a period of time where we believe God will not offer this love. And so, you know, we wanted to tell people that there's an opportunity that's still available to you. Take it, yeah. you know. Yeah. And I can think of many hundreds of other reasons for returning in the manner in which we have done sure. to illustrate what it means to be a loving person on earth. To, to do it without forcing people into coming into acknowledgement, to cause people to have to reason about what they do, the choices they make, you know, that are unloving, to cause them to see what it means to live a life of love. All, all these different things, you know, there's so many hundreds of things that we can't list them all now, but they are all good reasons for coming, not destroy the wicked. Yeah, yeah. That's a very gotcha. poor reason, but also not a reason that God would ever engage and as a result of my connection with God, I could never engage. I know other Christians would certainly like it to happen, but I've suggested to them that they're not very connected to God if they believe it's going to happen. Mm. Oh, thank mm. you. Mm.